So, uh, you know, what's this all about? This Super Bowl. Super Bowl is about two teams that have fought tooth and nail with everything in them for months to try to figure out how to get to the Super Bowl. Think about what it takes for an NFL athlete to get this far. You've got to win and win and win, and then when it all seems lost, you've got to win again. And all the while, what are you facing? Have you guys ever seen a football player after an NFL game? What they look like? I'm not talking about the quarterback. He's sipping tea in the back. You know? <laughs> Sometimes they get hit pretty hard, but I'm talking about the guys on the line. Their blood is coming off of them. You ever see them? They slide in. They get up. And there's just blood on their arm. Like, yeah. And then they go right into the next play. And they're like, yeah. What is that? <laughs> it's intense what they go through. Many times after a football game, that intense, they literally get into a bath of ice water. Because they don't want it to swell up so bad because they're so bruised up. Mm. Guys, I don't even like drinking water with ice in it, much less get into one. <laughs> and yet these guys are willing to get hit, beat up, beat down, criticized. It doesn't matter what it takes. They're like, I am going to fight. I'm going to win. So today, who wins, I believe, will be determined by heart, zeal, strategy. Of course, talent comes into play. <coughs> But the bottom line, whoever wins today is going to be their finest hour. That's the title of the lesson, our finest hour. And we're just talking about football. When you start talking about the Bible, when you start talking about Jesus Christ, what he has done, everything else pales in comparison to the heart that Jesus had, the love that he had. And so we're going to investigate a couple of scriptures today and try to get his heart because Jesus lived his finest hour every single day. Amen. I want to imitate his heart. I know that I'm not, not enough like Jesus. Come on, bro. I mean, thank you for all the compliments. I appreciate it. <laughs> but I know I'm nowhere near what I need to be. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to love like him. I want to give like him. I want to serve like him. I want to change and become more and more like him. So here in Matthew chapter 11, we're going to get some clues into his heart today as we strive for our finest hour. Matthew 11 verse 28, the Bible says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Anybody weary and burdened? Be honest, don't lie. Fred just got out of the hospital with pneumonia. He's sitting back here. Now that's a sold out disciple. Amen. Bro, I'm so fired up that you're here, and uh, we're so sorry you got sick. Literally had pneumonia, was in the hospital, and uh, almost died, but there he sits. So give him a hug, but run away quickly so you don't get known. (laughs) We get weary and we get burdened. Our hearts get heavy. Life gets difficult. You get one blow after another, one hit after another. He starts taking you out. And so Jesus says, hey, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Look what he says, and I will give you rest. If you're weary, you need some rest, right? If you're burdened, you need to have that rest so that you can be unburdened. Where are you at today? Are you weary and burdened? Jesus says, come to me. And then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. You know, when you think of a yoke, we're not talking about the inside of an egg. We're not talking about a fun tool that uh, we use to uh, go play on the playground. A yoke is to bind two oxen together. And oxen were made for one thing, hard work. That's what they do. And so you, you bind one oxen to another and you put them in a yoke and they go the same direction. And so you go, wait a minute, what, what do you mean that, that this yoke, what, I don't want a yoke. Do you want a yoke? Yoke means work. Yoke means I got to go the direction someone else is going that I might not want to go. But Jesus, listen. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. 
And you will find rest for your souls. You know, I first read the scripture early this week. I started studying for trying to figure out how to preach a lesson. I go, you know, right here Jesus says, you come and take my yoke upon you and learn, and you'll find rest for your souls. You know what that tells me? Our souls get tired. Jesus looks at me and you and he goes, listen, I know your soul is tired. But, but, but the soul is eternal, is it not? But my eternal soul, Jesus says, your soul could get tired. But listen, come to me, and I'm going to give you rest for your souls. Not the soles of your feet. Not your muscles after you come out of the gym or play a football game or, for some of us, walk down the streets. But he says, listen, I want you to find rest for your souls. And if Jesus says, come to me so you can find rest for your souls, it's because you need it. Our souls get worn out with the sadness of life, with the difficulties that happen, with disappointments, the regrets that we have, the sins that come into our lives. It starts wearing on our souls and it makes us tired men and women. And then it shows up physically and it shows up emotionally and we're just flat worn out and we're only like 21 years old. I hear 21 year olds talking about, you swear they're like 90, like, oh, my back hurts. Do you think they're going to die? And then talk to a 60-year-old. Good night. Grumpy old things. It's because their souls are tired. And they didn't go to Jesus. If you're a disciple of Jesus and you have a tired soul and a tired heart, you need to be close to Jesus. If you find yourself unable to give emotionally, and spiritually, and even physically to other people, you need to go to Jesus. In verse 30, he says, For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. What an amazing call. And as I thought about it, I go, wait a second. This is the guy who just back here in... And verse 12 says, From the days of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advanced, and forceful men lay hold of it. Just a few minutes ago, he said, i got to be a forceful man, or I can't enter the kingdom. How does being forceful and light load work together? He says it right here. So either Jesus contradicted himself, or we got to dig a little bit deeper. That's right. I don't believe Jesus contradicted himself. Matter of fact, this is the guy who is persecuted, he's hated, he's lied about, he's betrayed, he's denied by his own men, he's attacked daily by Satan. He was in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights fasting while Jesus was being tempted by Satan every day. He had his beard pulled out. He was beaten. He was flogged almost to death. And then they said, carry your cross. And he carried his cross 650 yards. Till they threw him on the ground. That's six and a half football fields. Carrying this thing after being beaten almost to death. And then he goes. And he's crucified. The nails in his hands. The nails in his feet, a crown of thorns on his head. And then as he's dying, every single person he looks at, he just shares his love with them. Hey, take care of my mom. What? What a tremendous heart. Wow. And yet Jesus says, hey, <laughs> come find rest with me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come follow me, <laughs> Jesus says. What? Come on, man. And I think it's easy for us to get stuck thinking, how in the world can Jesus say his yoke is easy and his burden is light? There's, you don't understand what I have to do every day as a disciple of Jesus. You don't understand how hard it is. You don't understand how much I have to deny myself and sacrifice and serve and give. You don't understand what's going on. Jesus, your burden is not light, and your yoke is not easy. Matter of fact, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. You're a liar. Until 
you understand that the cross was Jesus' finest hour. When he gave everything he had, and he literally had thoughts of giving up, he goes into the garden and he prays, God, I don't, I don't want to do this, but not my will, yours be done. How is it that Jesus was able to overcome? Because he loved his father so much. He submitted to his father in everything. And because he loved us so much. So the burden was light. The yoke was easy for him. I have three points today for us that I hope will help you live your finest hour. Amen. Point number one. In our finest hour, from the Lord, we will glean. So to glean, you guys know what that means? To glean, you want to get something out of what's going on. You want to pull something out. Or if you glean, it has to do with after the harvest happen, you glean what's left. In chapter 12, verse 1, let's read there. It says, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. They couldn't believe it. They're watching these guys of Jesus. And they go, look, 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 look what they're doing now. Look at those guys. Did you see that? Hey, Jesus, your disciples are sinning. They ate some of that grain. Sinful, wretched sinners. You know what's interesting? In Exodus 20, verse 10, in one of the Ten Commandments, it says to do no work on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees had gotten so into trying to obey the law because their thinking was, the more rigorously that I obey the law, the more righteous I am. So what they did is they added laws on top of God's law so that they hopefully wouldn't break God's law. And the more they focused on trying not to break the laws that they set to not break God's law, the more confused and hard-hearted they got. So they had even come up with a rule that says, well, okay, the Bible says you can pick the grain, but if you pick it, you can't rub it like this and then eat it. You've got to rub it with your fingertips. Because this is work, this is not. It's like, what? Do you understand anything about the Bible? Do you understand anything about God? Is this work and this isn't? Or is this work and this isn't? I think it takes more effort maybe to do this than, I, I don't know. And yet these Pharisees were so stuck on this. They couldn't see past what was going on. So Jesus answers in verse 3. Haven't you read? Can you imagine saying this to a Pharisee? The Pharisees who had the scriptures memorized, who wore their phylacteries because they, of the ones they memorized, they wanted everyone to know. Jesus looks at him and goes, haven't you read? I can imagine a couple deep breaths. Right then. Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple desecrate the day and yet are innocent? I tell you the one greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Haven't you read? Quite often, I think, we read the Scriptures. We look at the Scriptures, and we go, if I can just do those seven things... I'm really going to be good with God. If I can do those seven things, and the guy next to you, no, 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 bro, it's eight things. Okay, if I can do those eight things, I'm really going to be good with God. And there's another guy down the road that's like, no, 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 it's five things. Do these five things. You and God are good, man. It's all good. But the guy that has eight things done looks down on the guy with five things and judges him and goes, you know, I am more righteous. And they get focused on how many more things they've done than other people, and they forget... That God wants to forgive us. 
God wants to love us. Jesus suffered tremendously so that we could understand how to be a disciple. You know, the challenge here, I believe, is do you know the Word of God? Jesus is talking to the guys that should have known the Word of God better than anybody on the planet. And yet they didn't even know it. They knew the words, but they didn't know the meaning. They knew the words. They had the things memorized because they were all about trying to look good to men. And trying to defend themselves before God. But God says, no, I want you to know my heart. So Jesus uses two examples here. He says, don't, don't you ever know when David went there and he ate the consecrated bread? It was fine. God was pleased with him. He gave him victory after victory after victory. Because he made the law to expose man's sin so he would depend on God. David was so dependent on God. God goes, it's fine. Eat the bread this time. And the other example here is, it says that the priests desecrate the temple desecrate the day, excuse me, and yet they're innocent. What a priest had to do was take sacred bread and lay it in front of the altar. And the next day he had to make the bread, even if it was a Sabbath, he had to make, take the old bread out, make new bread, and bring it back to the altar, which was considered work. But God says, it's fine, because you're worshiping me. You're giving your heart to me. You're pouring yourself out to me. This is the heart I'm looking for. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. And he says that there's so many men that say they can't memorize the Bible. And yet they know every score, every player, the stats for every team. They know what days their team is playing, who they have to beat. And it's usually like a seven-point matrix that you've got to figure out who they've got to beat to get in the playoffs. They know all of that, but they say they can't memorize the Scripture. They have the phone number memorized to the pizza place down the street. <laughs> Can't memorize the scripture, though. We live in what is called the Bible Belt. We have the Bible everywhere you turn around. I was in a hotel the other day in another country. Sure enough, there's a Bible there. Everywhere we go, we have the Bible. We live in the Bible Belt, and people are starving for the Bible. My question is, are you reading the Bible like a Pharisee? Are you reading the Bible like you're desperate to get to know God? The Word was not given to us so that we had to do these things and act like I'm robots. The Word was given to us so that we would know the heart of God. Jesus said, okay, they didn't get it, so He came on down. He said, I'm going to show you what it takes to get close to God. And He was the Word of God, and He lived it out, and He showed them. So the question is, are you really digging into the Word of God? Are you doing your daily duty? I read my thing, therefore I am righteous. You read your Bible. You even have those horrific things. You check in for like uh, 30 minutes and then you check out. And then you tell someone, hey, I checked in and I checked out. So I'm good, right? I had my quiet time. And over the years, I think this, this concept that was supposed to be special and precious became... This thing we got to go do. Wow. <clears throat> Come on, Matt. Come on. He's talking to a guy. And he simply said the other day, Yep, I'm just going to get some fellowship with the Lord. And that hit my heart. I haven't heard anybody say that. Wow. Cool. And I thought, you know, how do I read the Bible? Cool, Matt. Do I, I read the Bible to get it done? Or do I read the Bible to get the heart of God? When I read the scriptures, we've got to have a conviction, not just a thought in our heads, but a conviction that when I read the scriptures, God is speaking to me. God wants to reveal himself to me. He wants to show me. So when I read the scriptures, it's not this thing that I have to do. It's not work. It's simply a joy to get into the scriptures. Let God speak to my heart. Slap me around a little bit. So that I can see my sin and then repent. Amen. How are you getting into word the last couple of days? Amen. So easy for us to not glean from Jesus what we need to. He's taken time with the Pharisees that hate him so badly to show them how to dig deeper into the scriptures. 
many of you are visiting this morning, and I'm talking to my congregation right now. I want to challenge my congregation to read the Bible at a whole different level, where you start reading going, God, speak to my heart. God, say something to me. Show me something I don't understand. Fix my heart, because sometimes it gets jacked up. God, speak to me. I need help. When we read the scriptures and we don't change, it's not that God's broken or the Bible's broken. It's she didn't get deep enough. Yeah. Scripture says, when I seek him with all my heart, I'm going to find him. Yeah. Really, the issue, I believe, is ambition. I spoke to the men on Wednesday night about having ambition. Yeah. Yeah. Ambition for life. Ambition for a career. Ambition for this, ambition for that. At the end of the day, none of it means jack diddly squat unless we have an ambition for God. It means nothing. (laughs) Do you have an ambition to know God? I often think of Paul as he's coming to the end of his life and he writes, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And he digs down deep. I want to know Christ. A man who spent 30 years preaching the word, almost dying all the time, just so other people can hear the message. He was driven to know God. Do you know the word of God? I came to conviction when I was a young man. That if someone will start reading the Bible, they're going to fall in love with the word of God. You start falling in love with the word of God, you're going to fall in love with God. You fall in love with God and there's nothing you can do to me. There's no amount of sin you can do against me that's going to get rid of me. You can't hurt me enough. You can't scare me enough. You can't persecute me enough because I fell in love with God. This morning, are you in love with God? A man in love with God, a woman in love with God will have their finest hour day after day after day. A person not in love with God looks at Christianity as a burden and their souls are tired. One more thing I got to do. Oh, and i got to go to work after I do that. I love reading the scriptures. This morning I woke up. I had my alarm set for 4.50. I woke up at 4. And I was laying there going, I was like trying to go go back to sleep. You know, I just try. You never do that. You just try. I'm just, I'm going to force it. I just rolled over on the pillow. I'm like, you know. (laughs) I was done. So I got up and I went out and I walked. And um, I had a great time praying to, to the Lord. It was awesome. I literally was like, gosh, God, I just, want to, I just want to talk to you. I just want to tell you what's on my heart. There's a lot of stuff on my heart. There's a lot of people that need things. A lot of people that are hurting. God, here's what's going on in my heart. And I poured my heart out about some of you. I poured my heart, about, heart out about some of me. I poured my heart out about a lot of things going on. And you know what? It was awesome. As I got back to the house, I was so happy. And then my wife had set up the espresso machine. Oh, man. Get my espresso. And I was like, you know, I need to pray a little more. And I sat on my little prayer chair in the middle of my living room. I was looking out my window. And I just felt like God wanted to speak to my heart. It's not a burden when you fall in love with God. It's not a burden. It's not this thing i got to do. It is a joy. But sometimes when our hearts get hard and you haven't really let the scriptures get in there for a while, it's going to take some perseverance. It's kind of like that first time you go back to the gym. You know how you go to the gym? You're like, okay, it's January 1st. Woo! Yeah. Hoo, hoo. Yeah. You do like 400 exercises, and the next day you're like, I am never doing that again, ever, for the rest of my life. So I'm not challenging you to go and start reading your Bible for three hours and studying 15 commentaries and doing an exegesis on the Levitical priesthood and the Melchizedek and all. I'm, no. Open the book and go, God, my heart's hard. Last time I read it, I, get, I got nothing out of it. And I know you want to speak to my heart. Please help me fall in love with your word so that I can fall in love with you again. Amen. Verse 7. If, uh, if you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. You know, amazingly in Hosea, Hosea is a prophet and God says, go marry an unfaithful woman. Basically a prostitute. And Hosea, being an obedient, amazing prophet of God, goes, okay, God, you said so. So he marries this adulterous woman. And she leaves, and she goes and commits adultery. God guy goes, go get her. He goes and gets her. He brings her back. Listen, be with me, be my wife. She runs off again. He go gets her. Be with me, be my wife. She runs off again, adulteress. 
And by chapter 6, you go, this is disgusting and berserk. What kind of man would do this? And then God goes, that's me with you. And in chapter 6 and verse 6, he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. What he's trying to tell us is that he's going to keep reaching out to us no matter how unfaithful we are. He's going to keep loving up on us. He's going to keep trying to pull us into the, the last day, and then it's on you. Yeah. But he's not going to quit. He's looking for mercy. He wanted Hosea to show mercy to this woman so he would understand what he was doing for the Israelites. We sacrifice. We work hard. We puff our chest out. Go, oh, I work hard. I sacrifice for Jesus. <laughs> and, and the Lord's like, <laughs> As he's wiping his mouth, you're like, well, Jesus, I died. Yeah. He can't stand it. Yeah. You're trying to do stuff so that he is pleased with you. You're trying, trying to do stuff to earn his love for you. He's like, no, no, you're the adulterous woman. I already love you. I love you. Stop being adulterous. Come back and be with me. And he has... An incredible heart, but the Pharisees missed it, and we can miss it very easily. Have you had the heart this year, it's only the 5th of February, to really repent of your sin? Or have you been the adulterous wife or husband? Have you drifted from God, hardened your heart, and then tried to give a bunch of sacrifices? You go, here, God, look at all the sacrifices. Look, 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 look. And God's like, I, I don't want anything to do with it. He's looking for your love for him. I want to challenge you right now to truly repent and come back to God with everything you've got. And if your heart's a bit hard and a bit crusty because you've hardened it and gotten into sin, you need to repent quickly. Talk to someone about it. Deal with that junk and start reading the Bible again. It will literally change you into a different person. It is the Word of God. Yeah. It'll change you. I appreciate uh, my brother Adrian. Adrian's been a disciple now for a little over two years, huh? Old timer. Adrian came around. He came from a uh, religious group that he realized that he bought into everything and never really read his Bible. Listen to what preachers and teachers said, but didn't have a clue what the Bible said. So he started studying the Bible. I remember a couple times he was so frustrated. just like it was hilarious to watch. <laughs> Believe the Bible says that. <laughs> Irritated. And at one point I said, listen, it's not me, bro. I just, I'm reading a scripture to you. <laughs> Throwing a fit. And then, but the thing about him is, I, I think somewhere he was taught how to love God. He was taught, at least i got to figure out how to love God, so he stuck it out. And then he's only been a disciple for about two years, and yet you, can, you watch this man get up and preach. Yeah. And you go, what? That guy knows the Bible like a beast. I mean, I've seen him do sermons where I'm like, how did he figure that out? <laughs> Taking notes, but dang, man. <laughs> I know the Bible. I'm a preacher, man. You know <laughs> And so often he's convicted me by his passion and his zeal and his drive and his ambition to know the Bible. But the other day we're sitting talking and he goes, you know, I got so focused on that and so into learning those things and all these things about the scripture. It's almost like I kind of missed the scripture. And so the last couple of days he's just been going back. I just want to read. I just want God to speak to my heart. And yeah, you need to know some of the other stuff. It's super cool. There's so many insights you can get. It'll blow your... Read one commentary and you go... I never thought of that. Yeah, but like 3,000 other people did. And now I just see Adrian just reading the scriptures because he wants to get close to God. I think about Marcel Turner up in Gainesville. Marcel is a hero to the church here, a hero to the church in Gainesville. He's just a, a, a phenomenal man of God. He's one of the most emotional men I've ever met in my life. You guys think I'm emotional. Me and Marcel start talking. We're both going, <laughs> it's terrible. But even as emotionally unstable as Marcel can be sometimes, he comes back. Because he fell in love with God's word. 
This man barely sort of kind of went to junior high and sort of iffy-ish kind of went to high school. Of course, sort of. But you would never know. He eats the word up. He consumes it. He meditates on it. And then he lives it out. And the little church up there in Gainesville is cranking along in an awesome way. See, I want to inspire you to have that kind of a heart. In your finest hour, from the Lord, you will glean. Are you going to have your finest hour in February 2017? As you get back into the Word of God. Secondly, in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 9. He says, going on from that place, he went into their synagogue. I like how it says into their synagogue. I mean, Jesus kind of invented that whole life thing, you know. But the synagogue had become a place of corruption and hard-heartedness. And so I think Matthew notes it was their synagogue. It wasn't Jesus' synagogue anymore. So he goes on to that place. He went into their synagogue. And excuse me, a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So get this, the Pharisees are in the temple. They're walking around and they go, oh, here come, hey, psst, I, I just see them nudging each other like this. Hey, Jesus just walked in. Okay, we're going to catch him, guys. We caught him with that wheat stuff and that was sinful. And uh, yeah. So they look over and they go, hey, psst, psst. hey here comes Jesus. And, and he's getting close to the guy with the shriveled hand. Watch this. And they're just watching. You ever watch other people and you hope to catch them sinning? <laughs> Who said, yeah? <laughs> yeah, all the time. <laughs> it's not a good thing, guys. Now, if you're watching if someone's sinning so you can help them, then amen. But if you're watching them, say, like, gotcha! That's... <laughs> so they go up to Jesus and say, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They know what he's thinking. Jesus loves people. Jesus wants to be close to people. Jesus wants to take care of people. And they see the guy with the shovel hand. I can even imagine if I like bumped him closer to the guy. Jesus kind of goes, yeah, okay. I bet they tried anything they could. And is it okay to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, if any of you had a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you take hold of it and lift it out? What's the answer? Yeah. Of course. That's money in the bank. <laughs> Cash dollars went in that pit. I'm going to get it out. I might not even like sheep. Sheep stink and they're stupid. But he goes and hits them where it hurts. I know you guys. If one of your sheep falls in the pit, you'll get it out. Because it's worth something to you, isn't it? Even if you don't care about the sheep, you're not a stupid sheep. You're going to go get it out. And he asked them, will you take hold of it on the Sabbath and lift it out? Of course they would. Which many would say, they worked, therefore they must be condemned. That's not what the law was made for. In verse 12, he just simply says, how much more valuable is a man than a sheep? If you guys love your sheep, or at least you love the money the sheep is going to get you so much that you'll get them out of a pit, why don't you help men on the Sabbath? This is no longer my synagogue. You've ruined it. You've destroyed what I came to build. Oh, but you'll go get your sheep, but you don't care a thing about a man. Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And he teaches them a valuable lesson. Point number two. In our finest hour, we'll die to make others clean. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hands. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the others. Guys, if you saw that, just somebody help me out. What would you say? Wow. Wow. What else? What would you be thinking? Jesus just healed this guy. His hand's been shriveled up. He can't use his hand. What would you say? It's a miracle. It's a miracle. This is crazy. How do you think Jesus feels about this man? He loves the guy. This is awesome. God is great. But what do the Pharisees say? Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Are you pouring your life out to save other people? Come on, Matt. Jesus joyfully 
stood up to persecution to heal this man and make him clean. Jesus joyfully put up with their hard hearts and he tried to teach them a lesson, even the guys who hated them. He goes, I want to show them how much I love people. I'm going to show them. And he heals the man. And what they should have said was, Jesus, that was amazing. Please help me have the heart that you have for people. I care a lot about sheep and money, but I've missed something. Are you pouring out your heart for people? Are you pouring out your heart for sheep? See, we will sacrifice for a job. We'll let our bosses tell us what to do, when to do it. You'll miss fellowship. You'll get idealistic about a job. But when it comes to, hey, listen, why don't we go and help this brother who's really struggling? You know, I'm really busy. I got things to do. And maybe, maybe one of the sisters can do it. We've got to have a heart to heal and make others clean with the same determination that Jesus had. We've got to go after it. We've got to go after it with a passion. This is the heart that Jesus came to show us how to take care of people. Even when everything is against you, he's serving and giving and healing. You know, I appreciate uh, this past uh, week, uh, Paula Harpel was really sick. And the other day she stood up and she just shared with the congregation, she says, you know, I am so grateful. I, I, okay, I'm going to tell you, I've never seen Paula cry. But Paula almost got a little tear worked up right there. And I go, whoa. And she was just like, I am so grateful for this congregation. When I was sick, everyone took care of me. Amen. Come on. And I go, that is awesome. That's the heart we've got to have. And then I was uh, perusing Facebook. Like, you guys ever peruse Facebook? You're just kind of scrolling through, you know. And you're kind of looking for something cool. You go, ooh, <laughs> and you find something cool. Hopefully it's not sinful. Amen? Amen. A lot of that on there. But... So I'm scrolling through, and I see this video of Natasha. Woo! So it was Natasha's birthday the other day, right? Yeah. And, and uh, Natasha is an amazing young lady. She's blind, but you would never know it. I mean, it's just, I can't even understand the things that she does. I, I'm like, she, li- I was talking to Jazzy, the same thing. They listen to scriptures and then they, then they tell you. I'm like, well, what? <laughs> I, can't. I, I mean, th- that's just like the tip of the iceberg. So anyway, in the video, it's, it's a surprise party. And so I'm just watching the video going, oh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? It shows Natasha walking in. I, I couldn't tell who it was walking in. And this is the funniest thing. So Natasha's blind. So she walks out. The first thing she does, she turns on the light. And I go, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Natasha, you can save a lot on energy bill. Just turn off the light. <laughs> That's the first thing. She walks in the house and she's got her cane. She walks through. She's like, click, turns on the light. And then there's in front of her, I guess one of the balloons from decorations that like bounced over. And the balloon is in front of her on the floor. And I'm going, oh, no, she's going to see it. <laughs> Wait, she can't see it. <laughs> so she's walking down the hall, and she kicks the balloon. And I go, oh, she's going to know. And all of a sudden, you, hear people, you see people come out. They're like, ah, she's got this big, giant smile on her face. She's so fired up. And here's what's amazing. You know what our church did? There were decorations everywhere. Come on. For Natasha, who can't see <laughs> But let me tell you what that showed me. Our congregation is becoming more and more and more about people and loving people. Yeah, they did it for Natasha, and I bet she was grateful. But just to see that heart start pouring out, serving and giving and making other people joyful and happy, it just moved. I was like, that was awesome. You know, last year, I don't know the exact number, but our church gave somewhere between ten to 12,000 of benevolence to meet the needs of our congregation. That's a huge percentage of what we give. That's far more than we give in benevolence. But you guys raised the money, and then you gave it to people in our congregation to take care of them. Amen. That is to be commended, and that inspires me. See, in our finest hour, we'll die to make others clean. Look in John 15. Come on, Come on. Come on. 
In John 15 and verse 12, the Bible simply says, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. You know, that is just a crazy statement. <laughs> For the rest of my life, I'm going to be trying to figure that one out. Just, oh, bro, all you got to do, sis, all you got to do is just love like Jesus. And I'm like, shit, you know, fell short again. But that's my heart. And I'm seeing more and more the heart of the Orlando church is to love like Jesus. In verse 13, he says, greater love is no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You know, Jesus was determined to heal and to serve and to give no matter what it cost him. Jesus, in the middle of opposition, was giving. He didn't matter what anyone said. He didn't matter what anyone did. He didn't matter how much he was in pain himself. He was serving and giving to make others clean. That's the whole reason he came. And all he says, hey, come follow me. And you love like that. And let me tell you something. The world's going to know that you're my disciples. My name will be lifted up. People will be drawn to me. They will change and they will fall in love with my Father. And it's going to be glorious and we'll be together in heaven. Amen. And all he asks is for us to do the same. If you haven't loved like Jesus, maybe it's because the opposition is too much. Maybe it's because you want to be given to so badly. You've drifted in your relationship with God and your relationship with people and you think somehow... That what you get from people is what's going to make you happy. It is more blessed to give than to receive, Jesus says. You start giving. I don't care what you get today. I really don't. Whatever you get today, you're going to get. But before you walk out those doors, I want you to stop and give. Just God, who can I give to? See someone with one of those long faces? You hear that joke? A horse walked into a bar, and the bartender said, Hey, why the long face? Horses have long... Okay. Maybe someone sitting right here has a long horse face. You can't see Fred's. He's got it covered up. <laughs> Maybe someone here, you can just tell there's something going on in their heart. Their face ain't right. Do you ever notice when people are happy, they stand up straighter, but when they're not, they kind of get the... This thing happens and the belly pooches out a little more. <laughs> okay, this is the big one. This is the big one. You ready? On the last song we're going to sing in a minute, look around. And tell me if they're smiling or singing. And if they're not, you go, hey, I, I know what i got to do today. Bro, I saw you weren't singing. Are you okay? Oh, I didn't know the song. Okay, well, here's the songbook. <laughs> But usually that's not the problem. Usually it's they got a long face because they got a sad heart. Yeah. They've got a broken heart. They drifted from God. They're hurting inside. They need some help. They need someone to care about them more than a stupid sheep. Yeah. And they need someone to care about them more than they care about themselves. In 1961, a great man... John F. Kennedy gave his inaugural address. Address. I'm going to read it to you now. I just want you to listen. I want to ask you if this pricks your heart just a little bit. He says, we observe today not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom. Symbolizing an end as well as the beginning, signifying renewal as well as change. For I have sworn before you an almighty God, the same solemn oath our forebears prescribed nearly a century and three quarters ago. This world is very different now. Remember, this is 61 before most of you were born. I wasn't even born yet. <laughs> Five years later. <laughs> he says the world is very different now, for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. At the same time, we can destroy life, we can destroy poverty. And yet the same revolutionary beliefs for which our forebears fought are still at issue around the globe. The belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. We dare not forget today that we are the heirs of that first revolution. 
Let the word go forth from this place, this time and place, to friend and foe alike, that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans, born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by hard and bitter peace. Proud of our ancient heritage and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, in order to assure the survival and the success of liberty. This much we pledge and more. To those old allies whose cultural and spiritual origins we share, we pledge the loyalty of faithful friends. United, there is little we cannot do in a host of cooperative ventures. Divided, there is little we can do, for we do not meet a powerful challenge at odds that split asunder. At all this will not be finished in the first 100 days, nor will be finished in the first 1,000 days, nor in the life of this administration, nor even perhaps in our lifetime on this planet. But let us begin. In your hands, my fellow citizens, more than in mine, will rest the final success or failure of our course. Since this country was founded, each generation of Americans has been summoned to give testimony to its national loyalty. The graves of young Americans who answered the call to service surround the globe. Now the trumpet summons us again, not as a call to bear arms, the arms we need. Not as a call to battle, though embattled we are, but a call to bear the burden of a long twilight struggle, year in and year out, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. A struggle against the common enemies of man, tyranny, poverty, disease, and war itself. And the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in this hour of maximum danger. I do not shank from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would change, exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And he's talking about politics. And he's talking about America. But he was inspired that this could be the greatest country on the face of the earth. And offer hope to other people. This is what Jesus brings to us. To his disciples to bring that to the rest of the world. And so my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. My challenge to you is ask not what your church can do for you, but what you can do for your church. And he finishes by simply saying, my fellow citizens of the world, Ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. This, this man had no understanding of how profound I think this really was. And spiritual, maybe he had some. Finally, whether you are citizens of America or citizens of the world, ask of us the same high standards of strength and sacrifice which we ask of you. With a good conscience, our only sure reward. With history, the final judge of our deeds, let us go forth to lead the land we love, asking his blessing and his help, but knowing that, that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. You know, today, are you a light to those around you? Do you love as deeply as Jesus did? Do you pour yourself out, give in yourself? Do you have a heart that in your finest hour you will die? To make others clean. No matter the cost. As disciples of Jesus. The quest that we're on. Is to get to every nation. In our generation. Right. To preach the word. Every single place. We can possibly get to. But it all starts right here in Orlando. Come on, if we have the conviction. That someday I'm going to do it in another city. Like maybe some of you are going on the Miami mission team. With me and my wife. If you're not doing it here. You won't do it there. Quit asking what the church is going to do for you and start asking what you can do for the church. Amen. The people that say, I see the problems in the church are many and many and many more. Wow. But the people that are solving the problems of the church, those are the ones that are going to change people's lives. Amen. That's the man that I seek to be. I don't want to be a guy that points out the problems. Anybody can do that. Amen. you got to understand, disciple, Christian, 
follower of God, that you are the answer and you can change it right on around. God came to set us free, not to be captives. He came to set us free so that then we can set other people free. And let's close out in verse 15 of Matthew chapter 12. You know, as you're turning there, I was, um, I gave a pretty challenging lesson to the men on Wednesday night. It was rather short, but I hit them in the heart, I think, because I had to first hit myself. Last couple of weeks, I've been diving into my heart, trying to find out what, what's happened to me. I'm not the way I think I should be. I'm, I'm doing a lot, but I'm not getting things done that I, that I love and believe in. I'm scratching the surface. So I gave the brothers a challenge. I said, guys, I want you to make a list of every single person you know in Orlando. I want you to write them down. And today is Wednesday night. And I want you to go tomorrow. And we're going to call it Throw Down Thursday. You know, Throw Down is like when you say, hey, you want to throw down like you're ready to fight, right? Okay? I said, guys, let's have Throwdown Thursday. I challenged the men to call at least half of the people on their list by Thursday and try to invite them to church, to Bible study, to get together, to reach out and give your heart to them. And I started getting messages back. Bro, I talked to this guy. This was awesome. This guy wants to come to church. This guy's going to study the Bible. It was so encouraging. But the most amazing one I got was from a brother named Jose Pepin. Jose shoots me a text. He goes, bro, I got halfway through my list. I'm at number 200. Wow. I was like, wait, what? And he goes, bro, I think there's a guy who's going to come to church with me. And I go, and that was Thursday. <laughs> Another half a list to go. Is that your heart? You know, I don't know if I have time to call 200 people. But after hearing what Jose did, I thought, you know, what? I'm going to try. You know what we need in our congregation? We need more men who are heroes. Yeah. Hero after hero after hero. So that night, all the Bible talk leaders, we formed a new group, and it's called the Mighty Men. Come on. And we're going to go after it. And we're not going to talk. We're going to do. We're not going to boast. We're going to give glory to God. Yeah. But the brothers went after it. And even today, there are a lot more people here today than there were last week because the brothers said, we need to step up and be leaders. We need to be heroes. And then in chapter 12, let's close out. Verse 15, it says, Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. What was he aware of? Aware that they wanted to kill him. Many followed him. And he healed all their sick. So guys, it's still the Sabbath and Jesus is still healing. So he just said, listen guys, I I appreciate your idea of what the scripture says, but you didn't learn anything. I'm healing on the Sabbath and you're not going to stop me. So he healed all their sick. Warned them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken to the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love and whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Till he leads justice to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. You know, point number three. In our finest hour, our purpose makes us a lean, mean, fighting machine. And that's what I saw in my brother Jose this past week. You know, today we'll be watching a football game, a lot of us. And there's going to be some heroes on the football field. And we'll talk about them, and about a week later, we'll forget. <laughs> Two years from now, you won't remember who won the Super Bowl. But if you serve and love someone, they may never forget. If you pour your life out for them and you help them become a true Christian or stay faithful when they're ready to quit, they will never forget. What I believe this church needs is more men who are heroes. That are lean, mean, fighting machine. But you know what's interesting? Talk to a soldier that's been to war and back. And you know what most of them say? I'll do it again right now. I'm like, I'm like, wow. To them, it's not a burden. 
It's just who they are. They want to defend. They want to take care of. They want to look out for. They want to protect. And I think this is the heart that we need to have. And that quite often, I think, as soldiers of the cross, we get flabby and weak. And it's time to start working out again. And as I started working out some spiritual muscles the last couple of weeks, it's been a joy. And the spiritual abs are getting a little better here. <laughs> These abs are about the same, but the spiritual abs, they're coming along. It, we're getting there. Although I did figure out some new ways to do some ab exercises this past week, and so it's feeling a little tight right now. <laughs> uh, you all noticed, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> You know, I'm going to close out with a speech from a great football coach that was looking for men who were lean, mean, fighting machines. He was looking for men that were willing to give up everything to be the greatest in the world. And he was so inspirational that he rarely lost. And I look at Jesus just simply saying, listen, by the time I'm done, the nations are going to put their hope in me. By the time I'm done what I do, by the time I'm done getting these men to do what I do, you're never going to forget. And here we are, over 2,000 years later, still inspired and blown away by what one man did by pouring himself out and training a few guys to do the same thing. All we need to do is imitate his heart. And this is just about football, but I I want you to hear the heart that I think it's going to take for us to continue turning the Orlando church so that we really can go plant Miami Fort Lauderdale this year. We've got some of the biggest goals we've ever come up with and their needs and their goals. Number one, we want to see more men in this church than ever before. We've worked really hard the last couple of weeks to raise our contribution. And you know what? You guys flat blew it out. We needed to meet some needs. And so you guys gave even more. I, I was so impressed by our congregation. We've put before you that we want to move 60 to 100 people down to Miami and no one flinched. Everybody was like, amen. (laughs) That's awesome. Now we got to actually do it. It's a big difference. And we can talk it and blow smoke all day. Now we got to do it. So when I got with the Miami mission team or the potential mission team, I said, listen, guys, this is going to cost you everything. There's no money for you, but we got to move other people. And plus we need, while we're doing all of that, we need to raise $250,000. Look around. Anybody here can write a check for $250,000? Just come and talk to me. We'll get this done real quick. I don't know if there's anybody here that might do that today. If you want to do that, please come talk to me. We'll have a good talk. I'll even buy you. I'll buy you lunch. Twice. And I'll get you a coffee. But I don't think there's anybody in our congregation that just can write a check like that. But what is it going to take? Why is it going to take this much? Because we've committed 100000 to give to our missionaries who are already on the mission field in third world countries. We've already committed that. 100000 was off, already on the table. We can't take it off. I've said before and I'll say it again. I will never allow us ever to miss a special missions contribution. Whatever the need is, if it's 100000 or 200000 we're not going to miss it. Because we got guys out there. There's some of my best friends and we sent them out there. And we're going to take care of them. But even equal to that, there's all the people they need to reach. So yes, we're going to take care of them. So we're going to take care of the 100,000. You guys did 138,000 last year. We can do 100,000. It's not a problem. Amen? But in order to make Miami and Orlando work, we need to raise another 150,000. We're going to need 25,000 to stay here in Orlando to make sure the church works here. And we need 125 down there to make it work down there. That's the, the largest number I've ever even brought up to you guys. But no one flinched. Everyone goes, amen. It's a little stutter, but everyone goes, amen. But guys, here's the deal. We're going to do it. We're going to figure it out. We're going to raise the money. And we're going to give God the glory. And we're not going to take it for ourselves. Period. It's what we need to do. And that's the heart I want to challenge you to have. Winning is not a sometime thing, says Vince Lombardi. It's an all the time thing. You don't win once in a while. You don't do do things right once in a while. You do them right all the time. Winning is a habit. Unfortunately, so is losing. 
There's no room for second place. There's only one place in my game, and that's first place. I finished second twice in my time in Green Bay, and I don't ever want to finish second again. This guy was driven, and we're just talking about football. We're not talking about people's souls. There's a second place bowl game, but it's a game for losers played by losers. <laughs> he didn't mess around. That's why he won so much. And it, has, and it is and always has been an American zeal to be first in anything we do and to win and to win and to win. And let me tell you something. I don't know about you. When you finish a game, do you want to win or lose? I, wanna, I don't, know I don't want to lose. Nobody wants to lose. And yet we settle for it so easily when it comes to things that we have a hard time getting our head around. I want to challenge you to really think differently as we finish this. He says, every time a football player goes to apply his trade, play his trade, he's got to play from the ground up, from the soles of his feet right up to his head. Every inch of him has to play. Some guys play with their heads. That's okay. You've got to be smart to be number one in any business. But more importantly, you've got to play with your heart. With every fiber of your body, if you're lucky enough to find a guy with a lot of head and a lot of heart, he's never going to come off the field seconds. Come on. See, that's what Jesus was saying. If you guys would learn from me, you learn that I'm going to give everything I got, and it's a joy. I love doing it. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, I went to the cross for you. Yes, I'm sacrificed for you, but I'm playing with every inch of what I've got. Running a football team is no different than running any other kind of organization, an army, a political party, or a business. The principles are the same. The object is to win, to beat the other guy. Maybe that sounds hard or cruel, but I don't think it is. It is the reality of life that men are competitive, and the most competitive games draw the most competitive men. That's why you're there, to compete. To know the rules and the objectives when they get in the game, the object is to win fairly, squarely, by the rules, but to win. And in truth, I've never known a man worth his salt who in the long run, deep down in his heart, didn't appreciate the grind and the discipline. Mm. There is something in good men that really yearns for discipline and the harsh reality of head-to-head combat. I don't say these things because I believe in the brute nature of man, that men need, must be brutalized to be combative. I believe in God and I believe in human decency. But I firmly believe that any man's finest hour, the greatest fulfillment of all that he holds dear, is that moment when he has worked his heart out in a good cause and lies exhausted on the field of battle, victorious. See, today I just want to encourage you that if we follow this incredible man, Jesus, our finest hour and our purpose will make us a lean, mean fighting machine. You'll get stronger. You'll get better. You'll impact more people. You'll change more lives. And I believe that 2017 will, in fact, be our finest hour. Amen.